Chapter 4, The Apex of Gothic Romance Horror in literature attains a new malignity in the work of Matthew Gregory Lewis, 1775-1818, whose novel The Monk, 1796, achieved marvelous popularity and earned him the nickname of Monk Lewis. This young author, educated in Germany and saturated with a body of wild Teuton lore unknown to Mrs. Radcliffe, turned to terror in forms more violent than his gentle predecessor had ever dared to think of, and produced, as a result, a masterpiece of active nightmare whose general Gothic cast is spiced with added stores of ghoulishness. The story is one of a Spanish monk, Ambrosio, who from a state of overproud virtue is tempted to the very nadir of evil by a fiend in the guise of the maiden Matilda, and who is finally when awaiting death at the Inquisition's hands, induced to purchase escape at the price of his soul from the devil, because he deems both body and soul already lost. Forthwith, the mocking fiend snatches him to a lonely place, tells him that he has sold his soul in vain, since both pardon and a chance for salvation were approaching at the moment of his hideous bargain, and completes the sardonic betrayal by rebuking him for his unnatural crimes, and casting his body down a precipice whilst his soul is borne off forever to perdition. The novel contains some appalling descriptions, such as the incantation in the vaults beneath the convent cemetery, the burning of the convent, and the final end of the wretched abbot. But the subplot, where the Marquis de las Cisternas meets the specter of his erring ancestress, the bleeding nun, there are many enormously potent strokes. Notably, the visit of the animated corpse to the Marquis's bedside, and the Kabbalistic ritual whereby the wandering Jew helps him to fathom and banish his dead tormentor. Nevertheless, the monk drags sadly when read as a whole. It is too long and too diffuse, and much of its potency is marred by flippancy and by an awkwardly excessive reaction against these canons of decorum which Lewis at first despised as prudish. One great thing may be said of the author, that he never ruined his ghostly visions with a natural explanation. He succeeded in breaking up the Radcliffian tradition and expanding the field of the Gothic novel. Lewis wrote much more than the monk. His drama, The Castle Spectre, was produced in 1798, and he later found time to pen other fictions in ballad form, Tales of Terror, 1799, Tales of Wonder, 1801, and a succession of translations from the German. Gothic romances, both English and German, now appeared in multitudinous and mediocre profusion. Most of them were merely ridiculous in the light of mature taste, and Miss Austen's famous satire, Northanger Abbey, was by no means an unmerited rebuke to a school which had sunk far toward absurdity. This particular school was petering out, but before its final subordination there arose its last and greatest figure in the person of Charles Robert Matorin, 1782-1824, an obscure and eccentric Irish clergyman. Out of an ample body of miscellaneous writing, which includes one confused Radcliffian imitation called Fatal Revenge, or The Family of Montorio, 1807, Matorin at length evolved the vivid horror masterpiece of Melmoth the Wanderer, 1820, in which the Gothic tale climbed to altitudes of sheer spiritual fright which it had never known before. Melmoth is the tale of an Irish gentleman who, in the 17th century, obtained a preternaturally extended life from the devil at the price of his soul. If he can persuade another to take the bargain off his hands and assume his existing state, he can be saved. But this he can never manage to effect, no matter how assiduously he haunts those whom despair has made reckless and frantic. The framework of the story is very clumsy, involving tedious length, digressive episodes, narratives within narratives, and labored dovetailing and coincidences. But at various points in the endless rambling, There is felt a pulse of power undiscoverable in any previous work of this kind, a kinship to the essential truth of human nature, 
an understanding of the profoundest sources of actual cosmic fear, and a white heat of sympathetic passion on the writer's part, which makes the book a true document of aesthetic self-expression, rather than a mere clever compound of artifice. No unbiased reader can doubt that with Melmoth an enormous stride in the evolution of the horror tale is represented. Fear is taken out of the realm of the conventional and exalted into a hideous cloud over mankind's very destiny. Matoran's shudders, the work of one capable of shuddering himself, are of the sort that convince. Mrs. Radcliffe and Lewis are fair game for the parodist, but it would be difficult to find a false note in the feverishly intensified action and high atmospheric tension of the Irishman, whose less sophisticated emotions and strains of Celtic mysticism gave him the finest possible natural equipment for his task. Without a doubt, Matoran is a man of authentic genius, and he was so recognized by Balzac, who grouped Melmoth with Moliere's Don Juan, Goethe's Faust, and Byron's Manfred, as the supreme allegorical figures of modern European literature, and wrote a whimsical piece called Melmoth Reconciled, in which the wanderer succeeds in passing his infernal bargain on to a Parisian bank defaulter, who in turn hands it along a chain of victims until a reveling gambler dies with it in his possession, and by his damnation ends the curse. Scott, Rossetti, Thackeray, and Baudelaire are the other titans who give Matoran their unqualified admiration, and there is much significance in the fact that Oscar Wilde, after his disgrace and exile, chose for his last days in Paris the assumed name of Sebastian Melmoth. Melmoth contains scenes which even now have not lost their power to evoke dread. It begins with a deathbed. An old miser is dying of sheer fright because of something he has seen, coupled with a manuscript he has read and a family portrait which hangs in an obscure closet of his centuried home in County Wicklow. He sends to Trinity College, Dublin, for his nephew John, and the latter, upon arriving, notes many uncanny things. The eyes of the portrait in the closet glow horribly, and twice a figure strangely resembling the portrait appears momentarily at the door. Dread hangs over that house of the Melmoths, one of whose ancestors, J. Melmoth, 1646, the portrait represents. The dying miser declares that this man, at a date slightly before 1800, is alive. Finally, the miser dies, and the nephew is told in the will to destroy both the portrait and a manuscript to be found in a certain drawer. Reading the manuscript, which was written late in the 17th century by an Englishman named Stanton, young John learns of a terrible incident in Spain in 1677, when the writer met a horrible fellow countryman and was told of how he had stared to death a priest who tried to denounce him as one filled with fearsome evil. Later, after meeting the man again in London, Stanton is cast into a madhouse and visited by the stranger, whose approach is heralded by spectral music and whose eyes have more than mortal glare. Melmoth the Wanderer, for such is the malign visitor, offers the captive freedom if he will take over his bargain with the devil. But like all others whom Melmoth has approached, Stanton is proof against temptation. Melmoth's description of the horrors of a life in a madhouse, used to tempt Stanton, is one of the most potent passages in the book. Stanton is at length liberated and spends the rest of his life tracking down Melmoth, whose family and ancestral abode he discovers. With the family, he leaves the manuscript, which by young John's time is sadly ruinous and fragmentary. John destroys both portrait and manuscript, but in sleep is visited by his horrible ancestor, who leaves a black and blue mark on his wrist. Young John, soon afterward, receives as a visitor a shipwrecked Spaniard, Alonso de Monsada, who has escaped from compulsory monasticism and from the perils of the Inquisition. He has suffered horribly 
and the descriptions of his experiences under torment and in the vaults through which he once essays escape are classic, but had the strength to resist Melmoth the Wanderer when approached at his darkest hour in prison. At the house of a Jew who sheltered him after his escape, he discovers a wealth of manuscript relating other exploits of Melmoth, including his wooing of an Indian island maiden, Emily, who later comes to her birthright in Spain and is known as Donna Isadora, and of his horrible marriage to her by the corpse of a dead anchorite at midnight in the ruined chapel of a shunned and abhorred monastery. Monsada's narrative to young John takes up the bulk of Matoran's four-volume work, this disproportion being considered one of the chief technical faults of the composition. At last, the colloquies of John and Monsada are interrupted by the entrance of Melmoth the Wanderer himself, his piercing eyes now fading and decrepitude swiftly overtaking him. The term of his bargain has approached its end, and he has come home after a century and a half to meet his fate. Warning all others from the room, no matter what sounds they may hear in the night, he awaits the end alone. Young John and Monsada hear the frightful ululations, but do not intrude till silence comes toward morning. They then find the room empty. Clay footprints lead out a rear door to a cliff overlooking the sea, and near the edge of the precipice is a track indicating a forcible dragging of some heavy body. The wanderer's scarf is found on a crag some distance below the brink, but nothing further is ever seen or heard of him. Such is the story, and none can fail to notice the difference between this modulated, suggestive, and artistically molded horror, and, to use the words of Professor George Saintsbury, the artful but rather jejune rationalism of Mrs. Radcliffe, and the too often puerile extravagance, the bad taste, and the sometimes slipshod style of Lewis. Maturin's style in itself deserves particular praise, for its forcible directness and vitality lift it altogether above the pompous artificialities of which his predecessors are guilty. Professor Edith Burkhead, in her history of the Gothic novel, justly observes that with all his faults, Maturin was the greatest as well as the last of the Goths. Melmoth was widely read and eventually dramatized, but its late date in the evolution of the Gothic tale deprived it of the tumultuous popularity of Adolfo and the Monk. <laughs>